Hi, my name's Jenny Gudgeon and I'm an artist and writer who's written a book describing all the mythical creatures who live in my local woods. This wood. My creatures come from the land of fairy, which is very different from the cute flying creatures called fairies. I don't know why they have the same name and it can be very confusing. Not all the creatures I see are cute. Some are friendly, others are bullies, some are sad and some are a wee bit scary and should be avoided. During this workshop I'm going to help you imagine your own mythical creature so that you can write a story about them and make a picture or a model of them. Also there will be times when you want to pause the video to look at pictures or to read some writing more closely. This is something I do a lot when I'm watching workshop videos and it helps me understand what I need to do. So I'll be encouraging you to do this throughout the workshop to press pause for a minute and do a task in more detail. My first task for you today is to think for a minute about mythical creatures and think about how many different ones you can think of. So if you're with someone, then think of as many creatures as you can between the two of you. Okay, so pause the video now and think of your creatures. Did you get any good ones? I know a lot of mythical creatures, so I thought about my favourites. I thought about gnomes, who are the friendliest creatures and who first welcomed me when I came to the woods. I thought about selkies, who are Scottish creatures um, who have a seal skin and they are so gentle and kind. And I also thought about the Loch Ness Monster, who is the shyest creature I know and hates the fact that everyone calls her a monster. Did you say any of those? I'm sure your ones all were great. So in this workshop, I'm going to tell you the questions that I ask myself when I come up with my creatures. And you are also going to think up answers to those questions cr to create your own creatures. After you've written your story, I want you to go for a walk in your local park or woods. And so you can collect some natural materials to use in your picture or model. But I want, also want you to see if you can spot some signs that mythical creatures have been in your wood or park. I'll show you what signs to look for in a minute and I'll also tell you how you can try and see magical creatures if you want to. Don't worry, the scary ones don't come when you call. Only the friendly ones do that. Once you've finished your story and picture or model, you can email them to on5 by the 31st of March March 2021 and I'll choose the best one to win a copy of my book Folkland Fables and Folkland Fables the colouring book. Before we start I'm going to show you a couple of my pictures and explain how I make them. Basically I scrape pictures of mythical creatures into photographs I'm not going to teach you this during this workshop because not everyone has photographs to use and it doesn't work with photos printed from a computer printer. So this is my unicorn picture and I've added my base photograph underneath it so you can see where I've scraped away to show the creatures. This picture is of uh, my gilly-doo. He's a guardian of the fairy wood and is very camouflaged. Can you see him? Here, I'll circle him for you because he's really hard to spot. You might have noticed also that there's a face in the tree, but that's the tree spirit that the gilly-doo is talking to. So this now is a short film showing how I scrape into photos. It's a little bit like drawing, but when you use a pencil, the picture gets darker the harder you press. And when you're scraping into a photograph, the picture gets lighter the harder you press. What I do is I put a little bit of water onto the photo to make the surface soft. And then I use a special tool to scrape off the top layers of the photograph. 
the red on, that you can see is near the surface, then the yellow is about midway down and um, the white is all the way down to the base paper at the bottom of the photograph. So now I'm going to show you three signs to look out for when you're walking in your woods or your park. Oh, and by the way, if you are walking in a park, then go to a scruffy area a bit because mythical creatures don't like nature that's too neat and tidy. Oh, except the wood brownies, of course, because they've been cursed by the shining ones to clean the woods all the time. The first th thing to look out for is trees that look like they've been pushed over, like this one here. Sometimes trees fall over naturally in the wind and sometimes it's by giants. Now, when I tell children this, they can get a little bit scared because giants in your local park sound like a scary thing. But I want to tell you there is no need to be scared of giants. I think of them like toddlers who spend most of their time having fun and playing games. If you've got a younger brother or sister, you'll know that they can sometimes get a temper tantrum and giants also get temper tantrums, especially when it's stormy outside. And when they do, they knock over a few trees. You're not going to be in the park in, during a storm, so you've got nothing to worry about from giants. Now, have a look at this tree. This is definitely giant damaged. The second thing to look out for is holes in the tree, about the height of an adult's head like this one. Um, you can see this one was done quite a while ago and it's all sort of closed up a bit. These holes are from unicorns being trapped in the tree. Uh, the way to catch a unicorn is to stick up a picture of a lion onto a tree. Unicorns hate lions, so they charge at the picture and get their horns stuck in the tree. And you've caught a unicorn. When the pucks arrive at Folkland Wood, it's their favourite prank, and I spend a lot of my time rescuing unicorns from them. The last sign is the most important, and will also be one that you are unlikely to ever hear. But if you're going to start looking for mythical creatures, you need to be aware of the shining ones. They always have bells in their hair, so listen out for tinkling bells at all times. The shining ones don't leave the land of fairy very often now, and I've only ever seen them once in my entire life. But I always do listen out for them. If you hear tinkling bells when you're out in nature, the best thing to do is to pretend you haven't heard a thing. If they, can, if they think that you can't see them, they will have no interest in you whatsoever and pass you by. Can you hear any bells now? Let's listen. Nope, we're good. So let's go and find a tree to see if any creatures will let us see them. Creatures from the land of fairy don't show themselves to humans very often. I see them all the time, of course, but that's because I'm something called a seer. That's someone who sees the creatures from different worlds. There's a way to teach people how to see glimmers of the creatures, and that's what I'm going to show you today. I also want you to know that you don't have to take part in this workshop if you don't want to. It can feel kind of strange the first time, so if you feel a bit scared, then just stop. These pictures are of the creatures you're likely to see if you see anyone. They've been drawn by a couple of very famous artists who also saw fairy creatures. Can you see how the creatures are hard to spot? They show up in the shadows and in the bark of the wood. When you want to see a fairy creature, the best thing to do is to stop walking and talking. Then you look around you for the nicest looking tree. This one here is my favourite. This will be different for everyone because everyone sees the world in a different way. When you've chosen a tree, I want you to go and touch it and sing a few lines of your favourite song 
just from the chorus, but sing it loudly and with joy. The mythical creatures are really musical and this will call out to anyone who's nearby. It doesn't matter what your favourite song is, but it does need to be sung with all the kind of joy and happiness that you can get. After you've sung, you've got to be completely silent and look around you, just for a minute or so, and look into the shadows and the shapes of the trees and the barks. You might just be lucky enough to see a creature waving back at you. If you do see one, don't point at them. They really don't like being pointed at and they'll get annoyed and you will never see one ever again. While you're on your walk, you might want to con collect some natural materials to use in your picture of your mythical creature. Remember to bring a bag with you so you can take it all home with you. Now, there are some rules you need to follow when you pick up natural materials in the wild. Don't pick anything alive, no flowers or leaves from trees or bushes. Don't pull bark or branches off from alive trees, but if you find them on the ground here, you can pull the bark off from dead stuff, okay? So respect plants, respect the environment, and only take what is already dead. Except moss and grass, that grows very, very easily in the woods, but only take a little bit of it. As you can see here, I've been collecting some natural materials. I've got some twigs there. I've got this branch, which is all covered in moss. I've got some moss. I've got some leaves. I've got a wee bit of grass. I've got some pine cones. I've got some fir tree twigs that I found on the ground. I didn't go and pick those off a tree. And I've also found these amazing monkey puzzle branches that were just lying on the ground underneath one of the trees. Here's a unicorn I made from the items I collected. And as you can see, I've swept all the, the leaves away so you can really see it clearly. And here's a giant's head that I've made that's really, really enormous using lots of big branches and we found a branch for the mouth and then lots of little branches for the hair too. Now it's time for you to make up your mythical creature. Now I don't want you to make up a story of a creature that already exists, but if you can't think of a creature yourself, you can mix a few creatures together like say a unicorn puck or a giant fairy. Your creatures can be as weird, silly or strange as you like. It's totally up to you. I'm going to read my troll story to you now, then tell you more about how I thought it up. He lives under this bridge here and this is the photo I took of the bridge to scrape my troll into. Here's the troll who peeks at me through the holes in the bridge whenever I walk across. And this, these are the magic plants that fill the woods and hides him a lot of the time. These plants aren't usually seen by humans, so you're very lucky. It's a lot harder to see the troll though now, isn't it? Let's have a look at the picture properly uh, to, and see if you can find all eight bees that are hiding in the picture. Also have a look to see what animals you can spot while I tell you a little bit about the troll. Every time I see our troll, my heart breaks a little bit more. No goats trip trap across his bridge near the meadow, so he is always hungry and ever so sad. He tried to eat a couple of children once, but they burnt his throat horribly. He cried as he watched them run off home, covered head to toe in slimy yellow troll saliva. If you have to cross his bridge, it's a good idea to shout out to him when you get near. I hate watching his hope turn to sorrow when he realises he can't eat me. Each time I promise to find him a goat, but I cross my fingers. 
Trolls are disgusting eaters. Occasionally, the punk pucks forget the trouble they got into last time and give him a goat. Now, trolls leave their food for a while before eating, so his bridge becomes a total no-go area because of the stink of decayed goat. They also like to eat the same meal over and over again. They say this is to enjoy the meat's distinctive flavour fully. The troll's goat meat sick decorates the nearby trees for months on end. Ugh! Yuck! I've never seen the troll all at once because he likes to stay hidden. Normally I just see his eyes and fingers peeping through holes in his bridge. But for one week a year, as winter is turning into spring, he leaves his bridge every night. In the mornings, I see his saliva trails glistening in the sunlight high up in the treetops. I've no idea why he climbs up there, and I've stopped trying to stay awake to watch him after I noticed that I always fell asleep on the dot of midnight. Our troll is miserable, which upsets me a lot. I've tried so many ways to make him happy, without goats, and I know that I've failed. I'd be thrilled if you could succeed. It would be nice for us to have a happy troll here. When I'm writing my stories, I like to think about three different things. Firstly, I want to make my creature's behaviour a bit of a surprise. So in the troll story, no goats ever go across his bridge and he doesn't have anything to eat. He can't even eat children. He's a sad troll, not a scary troll like you usually hear about. The second thing I like to do is I want, I imagine what my creature would be like if I saw them every day, like someone in your class. And I think about how I would feel towards that person. So in the troll story, I feel sorry for him and his sadness upsets me a lot. Now, he's a disgusting eater, which uh, which I do not like, but he also seems pretty nice. I'm also sad about the fact that I haven't found a way to make him happy without giving him any goats, which I refuse to do because that's a lot of mess. Lastly, I like to think of an event that happens to my creature, and then I think about what they would do and why. So, with my troll again, I decided that the pucks, who are very, very naughty, would give him a goat. And then I could describe exactly why he was such a horrible eater and exactly what he does. And that was quite a lot of fun to to write and I enjoyed it. So, when I'm writing my characters' stories, I think about all those three things... And at the same time, I answer a set of questions about each of them. And this helps me know everything I want to know about them. Uh, And that's what you're going to do too. When I write about my creatures, the questions I ask myself help me work out everything a, a new person needs to know about my creatures when they first meet them. Now... When you write down your answers to these questions, this is just for notes for yourself. You're going to be making those into a story later on. So they don't need to be neat and tidy. Um, When I write my notes, they they are very, very scruffy because my handwriting is really messy. But no one else is going to see my notes, so I don't care. No one else is going to see yours either. But if you need help with the writing, you can ask your parent or teacher to help you. And that'll help you get your ideas down. Next, I'm going to go through each of these questions about your creature in more detail. Underneath each question, I'm going to put down some ideas that you might want to use to help you if you're finding it hard to think up an answer by yourself. These questions don't need to be answered in order. If you can't think of an answer to one of the questions, 
then don't worry, you can go back to it at the end or you can even leave it out altogether. These are the questions that I use to ask myself about my, my creatures. But if you want to answer a different question or write more information, then go ahead and do it. This is your story, it's not mine. Now, the first question I ask myself is what does my creature look like? Is it big? Is it tiny? Is it covered in scales? Is it hairy? Does it have one eye in the middle of its forehead? Does it have enormous feet? Does it have horns? And if so, how many? The second question is how do they behave towards you and how do they behave to other people? So are they scary? Are they just not really very nice or are they very friendly? Are they loud or quiet, neat or messy? Are they wild or tame, happy or sad? And are they your friend? The third question I ask is why? Why do they behave like they do? Now think hard about this one. It could be because they're all on their own or they've been enchanted so their words come out all wrong or that people annoy them because they demand wishes all the time it can really be anything you like but make sure you say that in the uh, in the story fourth question how do they make you feel do you feel safe with this creature or are you scared of them annoyed by them do you want to impress them and want to be their friend? Or do you want to help them be the best person they can? The fifth question is what is surprising about your creature? Now, do they behave like they look? Are they tiny but incredibly strong? Do they look beautiful but act evil? Do they wear something strange and you don't like to ask them about it? The gilly do in my story wears a uh, necklace of baby teeth. He's the uh, tooth fairy of Scotland, but I've never really wanted to ask him about it. So the sixth question is, I want you to think of something that you and your creature have done together. This might be something you do together regularly or it might just been a one-off thing that happened and now you try to avoid them. So do you play games together? Have they taken you into the treetops and left you to find your own way down? Do you have to do something to pretend that you're not scared of them when you meet? Well, things like that. So, Question seven, where in your local area does your creature live? Now, this can be your favourite place or somewhere you don't like very much, but make sure it suits your creature. So if your creature is scary, it might live in the place that scares you the most. Or if your creature is friendly, it was, could be somewhere you like going. Number eight. What does somebody need to know when they first meet your creature? This is an important one because your story is to tell people what they will expect when they first when they meet your creature. So, is your creature going to be going to ignore new people? Are they shy of them or are they going to be nasty to them? Are they going to be nice? Could be they could go and say hello. Are, will they hide from new people or are they going to drop on them from a great height and try and unscrew their head? Number nine, what is your creature's name? Now, some people find this incredibly easy and other people find it very, very hard. It, I make this always the last question because I find thinking up names for things to be very, very hard. And I find it easier if I know as much as possible about a creature before giving them a name. 
that's all of the questions. And like I said before, if you want to make up your own questions and answer those instead of these ones, then go right ahead. But once you, and once you've answered your questions, you will know so much about your mythical creature and you'll be ready to make your notes into a story. You can put your answers into your story in any order. It doesn't have to be in the order that the questions were asked, but it is best to start off with what your creature looks like. It means that the person reading it can imagine what they look like straight away. Once you've finished writing the story about your creature, it's time to make a picture or a model of them. I always do this after writing my story because I like to make uh, the picture of something that happens in my story. Now this picture is one of my most recent ones from my next book. It's the Blue Men of the Minch. They live in the cold water off the coast of North Scotland. So when they have time off on sunny days, they sit in rock pools, which are so much warmer that they seem like hot tubs to the blue men. By the way, they're called blue men because of a bad translation. They actually are the dark men of the Minch. So I want you to make your picture or model to show something that's happening in your story too. Have a good think about what will make the most exciting picture or model. You can create your creature's picture in whatever way you want. It can be as big or as small as you like, and you can use whatever you want to make it with. Pencils, felt tips, crayons, paint, or you can make a model using junk modelling or air drying clay if you have it. You can use some of the natural materials you collected to be part of your picture or model. Or, like I said earlier, you can make your picture in the park or the wood while on your walk using the natural materials you collect. You can do whatever you want to make your picture or model. When you've finished your story and picture or model, get your parent or teacher to take a photo of both your story and your picture or model and email them to ypbookings at onfife.com before the 31st of March 2021 to be in with a chance of winning my books. Remember to include your name, your age and a phone number. The competition is for UK children only age 12 and under. I'll pick my favourite and the winner will be announced by the 12th of April 2021. Good luck and I can't wait to see all your creatures. If you want to learn more about me and see more of my pictures, you can visit my website at www.jennygudgeon.co.uk and your parents and teachers can follow me on Facebook and Instagram at Jenny Gudgeon Artist and Writer. My Folkland Fables books are available to buy from Amazon or together as a discounted bundle from my website. This workshop has been brought to you from On Fife to celebrate World Book Day. Please join the On Fife Virtual Library Yay Facebook group to get weekly themed ideas and activities to help you with home learning. I hope you enjoyed my workshop and thank you very much for watching.